I guess, I guess. Good evening, everyone. Um, we'll start in just a little bit. We'll give everybody kind of the uh, three minutes to realize the meeting is starting and then log on and all of that. And if you uh, want to say hello or talk, go ahead and unmute yourself at this point. Hi, Penelope. Thank you for, for doing this. It's uh, it's wonderful to get some ideas because oh, it's been, leave us you on. know, so unnerving trying to figure out what we're doing. So I really appreciate it. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad we can uh, be of service. <laughs> Help each other out in this crazy time, right? Well, he was there, but he went. Probably getting something together. He's there. Huh? Yeah. Not really. I didn't just run for the hills. I can't hear him. It's unmuted. We hear you. We can hear you. Oh, no. Maybe. Oh, I don't have that sound on. Probably. We hear you. I'm not hearing anything. For anyone who just logged in, we're going to wait until about 7.03 before we get started. All right, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Jared Berry, and I have the privilege of serving as the ACDA Eastern Region 
2022 Conference Chair for Communications and Personnel. Um, the, the series of uh, workshops that we presented earlier today, tonight, and tomorrow afternoon all came out of needs that many of us have as we approach this time of uncertainty uh, during the pandemic with remote and hybrid and needing more technology. And it came out of the generosity of many folks who are willing to share. And tonight we are thankful to uh, Rob Natter. Rob is the treasurer of ACDA Eastern Region. He is the director of choral activities at Gettysburg College. And he is also the creator of Choral Works. Um, we, there will be one more session that we at ACDA Eastern are offering. It's tomorrow from 1 to 2.30. And it will be presented by myself and Ariane uh, uh, Harley Emerson from Delaware on uh, My Choral Coach, which is also another new app. Tonight, it is, this session is being recorded and it will be available afterwards on the ACDA Eastern YouTube channel. Uh, throughout the evening, you will all be muted. Um, if you have questions, you can type them into the chat. Penelope and I will be moderating, but I know that Rob will also be checking in on that occasionally and will answer questions as they come up. So without further ado, Rob Natter. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you all, and I appreciate your uh, willingness to spend a little time uh, uh, thinking about some of the things that we can do for, uh, for our students. Uh, as Jared said, I'm the Director of Choral Activities at Gettysburg College, and um, you're going to see my email in the, in the PowerPoint here very soon, and also I have just put it into the chat. So if anybody has any questions, you can con contact me directly. And everyone is going to get, at the end of the session, is going to get uh, a version of the PowerPoint. And, um, and that'll be right in the chat and also will be available on the website as well. OK, so a couple of ground rules for the presentation. Feel free to have your video on or off. Um, a lot of studies have, have uh, talked about how um, you really need to be uh, um, cognizant of how your, uh, how your folks feel about um, about being on screen. And as Jared said, you'll be muted for a while. There'll be a couple of times during the presentation when we can have some actual periods for questions and answers, but go ahead and put them in the chat right, uh, right away when you want to. If you went to Ariane's presentation this afternoon and I see a lot of familiar names, it was just fabulous. Uh, I was just thrilled to see him cover so much material in a short period of time. It made me excited about things um, that I can use to help uh, with my singers and my choirs. You'll be happy to know that a lot of what you learned there can also be used with choral works. And of course, we all need to assemble all the tools we can to help our singers make music. Um, uh, whether it's the things that Ariane showed you this afternoon or my choral coach, or if choral works works for you, that's great. I'm going to share my screen, a screen with you right now. And uh, let me go ahead and put that up. I'll share my computer sound as well. And you should be able to see a, you should be able to see my, um, my PowerPoint right now. Is that true? Jared, I can't see you right now. So can you say whether yep, or not it's you can see? It's all good. We see you. Okay. That's excellent. That's excellent. Thank you. My, the, the video window disappeared as soon as I did that, of course. All right. Uh, so uh, the PowerPoint will be up here. And here's the app on the left side. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about what we're going to do today. There's all kind of the information. And then go ahead and I'll tell you a little bit about what we're going to do during tonight's presentation. First of all, I'll give you a demo of the Coral Works app itself to show how it works. It's there on the left side of your screen, and um, uh, I'll show you all the stuff that's going on there. Um, hopefully, that will get you very excited, and you'll want to know about how to set up Coral Works for yourself and uh, make one of these files for yourself. And then, of course, all of that stuff is great, but uh, it doesn't do you a lick of good until you can make some Coral Works files available for your singers, and I'll show you how to do that as well. We'll take a little bit of attention to talk about copyright issues as they uh, pertain to uh, Coral Works, and we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers. And uh, also, like I said, everyone will get a PDF version of the PowerPoint. If you think of the PowerPoint as going together with the video, both of those things should cover pretty much all of the, all of the things that uh, we're going to talk about tonight. 
And so I imagine later you'll have both the PDF and the video to review what happens and you can go at your own pace. Okay, so like many of you, I teach singers with a wide variety of experience and expertise. And some of them are very accomplished, while others may be beginners who perhaps don't read music well yet. Uh, hopefully they will by the time they've been uh, in my choir for a while. One of our challenges as choral directors is helping newer singers learn their music while keeping more experienced singers engaged on another level and, um, and dealing with both of those cohorts at the same time. And of course, we all want our singers to become independent musicians, to be able to read and learn music on their own, but sometimes we need to give them some help and lots of people use online rehearsal tracks to help their singers learn music. Um, and uh, uh, many of us do that, of course. Uh, we, uh, uh, Ariane was talking about that this afternoon, especially in the area, era of COVID-19 where many of us are doing things online. It's just really important to be able to do that. Uh, there are lots of ways to do this and lots of new ones coming out, uh, like My Coral Coach, which you'll hear about tomorrow. Uh, many of you know about Note Flight. Ariane showed you some ways to make them yourself. Um, and those are all really good tools and part of the arsenal that we all need as modern choral conductors. Uh, many of those tools cost money, uh, particularly for the good stuff, or require you to put your music on their servers. Um, the Matthew Curtis makes beautiful, beautiful stuff, uh, but, not, but it's not free. Uh, Note Flight is great, but again, not free and budget money is scarce. And a free solution might allow you to spend your budget money on more music for your singers. Or if you're, uh, you know, maybe you, don't, maybe you don't have a budget at all. Maybe you're a church choir and, you, you know, you don't have enough um, money even to buy music. Uh, so you're watching, pinching every penny. Almost all of us are doing that. YouTube is free, of course, and it's a great way to get things out, but it's kind of limited in flexibility. You have to make a new video for each project if you want. Uh, if you want to have different voice parts, you need a new video for each one of those. And YouTube is also high bandwidth, which may or may not be suitable for your singers who are on their phones or on spotty internet or, you know, in COVID-19 who are sharing an internet connection with their siblings or their parents who are doing their work. Uh, lots of folks just don't have a, a really solid connection and this is low bandwidth. Uh, MuseScore, uh, Ariane talked about a little this afternoon. MuseScore is a great way to do all this, but there's not really a very good interface for your phone for free. And uh, so that's an issue you might think about too. So again, my point is there are lots of tools and everyone should use the ones that make, make sense for their budget and for their value. And, but when I'm thinking about Corox, I think, oh, wouldn't it be great if there was an app that puts part learning all in one spot for free on a computer or cell phone, everything all in one place. And that's what CoralWorks is all about. So uh, let's get right to it, shall we? Uh, you, I'm sharing my screen there with you. Um, CoralWorks is designed to be used on cell phones because that's where our students live, I think. Uh, but for the sake of Zoom screen sharing, I'm going to show it to you on my computer. And, uh, you know, I can't share my screen with you very well on a phone. Um, so I'm going to show it to you in phone emulation mode. And that's what's going on over here. Uh, so it's supposed to look a little bit like a phone. And it's, it's kind of is using an interface that looks like a phone there a little bit. I'm also showing it locally. Um, on my sort of home local host server instead of on the internet. We're at, we actually will go on the internet, but I'm doing that so this address doesn't make any sense up here at the top to most of you probably, because I'm running it locally. Um, I'm doing that so Zoom doesn't get confused. Zoom's poor little brain doesn't get confused because I'm trying to share too many things about it at one time. All right, so I'm gonna do a little demo of the app right now. Uh, and you're gonna get to do this very soon. I'm gonna give you a link so that you can play with it on your own computer or your own phone, but for now I'd like you to stick with me if that's okay. All right, so actually I'm a little ahead of myself because this is actually the first, ooh, I should show, I should show it to you from scratch so you can see this splash screen. And uh, then this is the first page that you see. And basically what you, need, what you need to do here is enter a link to a MIDI file. I'll talk about MIDI files more later on. Or you can choose a MIDI file from your own computer. I'm gonna go ahead and open one up right now. Uh, this is one that's out on the internet. And this is Cantati Domini by Hans Leo Hosler. And this is the main screen for CoralWorks. And basically, uh, this, will, this format will look very familiar to just about everyone. You have your play button and you have your rewind button and you can hear the sound. Everybody dance. 
you can rewind and play it again. Those are the basic controls that everyone is familiar with from using any kind of uh, digital music player. Uh, one thing I'd like you to notice, though, is that the sounds are good piano sounds. It's not synthesized sounds uh, like you find on a lot of uh, on a lot of programs. It's actually samples of a real piano playing. And I think that's important because I find it difficult to hear, particularly separation of parts, when I'm dealing with a synthesized sound. I find a piano much better for that sort of thing. Uh, okay, so you have play and rewind. And then up here you have sort of the position control. And what this means here is that you're in bar three, beat one, and then subdivision one. In this case, it's eighth notes. So it tells you where you are all the time and you can scroll to any part in the piece. That's bar 37, uh, beat four, right at the beginning and it would play right from there. I thought I went there for, because for that my money, that's the climax of the piece. So that tells where you are, the bar, beat, and subdivision. And then you can also make tempo adjustments as well. I'm gonna go ahead and rewind down here at the bottom. On the lower right is a tempo control. And you can see that it's at 110 right now, but you might want to go a little slower if you're learning. So I'm going to move that down to, shouldn't be doing that. I'm going to move that down to about 100 or so and close it. And you'll see that it's now at 97. That might be good for somebody who's using something that uh, who uh, is working on a fast passage who needs to slow it down so that they can uh, learn it a little bit more uh, more gently, I suppose. So tempo adjustments. So that's one thing. We'll come back to that. The other thing that's important about this <coughs> is that uh, you can mute or adjust the sound, the volume of any track. So if you're a soprano and what you're trying to do is learn your part you can turn off all the other parts and just hear your part. Of course, I've picked a spot where it's not playing. So this is great. Susie Soprano can learn her part right there and when she feels a little bit more confident, when she feels a little bit more confident, she can add in the other parts and maybe she wants to take a, a, a step along the way, so she's gonna turn down the other parts so that she can hear the other parts while she's doing her part. I hope you can hear that on your computer that the alto tenor and bass parts are a little bit less and the soprano part is quite dominant. So easy enough. And then when they feel a little bit more confident, what I always tell my students is that they're ready for rehearsal when they can hear all the other parts and turn off their own part. And if they can sing their part with all the other parts playing but not hearing their own part, then they're ready to go. And so I'm, I think that's a pretty valuable thing. And all of this comes from one small MIDI file that you would make and put out there for your students to do. You don't have to make four different videos or five different videos, one for each voice part and then one that's all of them together or anything like that. Um, and without a tool like this or something like MuseScore, we'll do something like this too. Without a tool like this, you'd have to make separate files for each part and get them to the student. And this is the power of CoralWorks. You open up one file and have all of these capabilities in one place from one tiny little file. Uh, so notice, I'm going to go back for a second, notice that we're not limited to four voices. CoralWorks will show us as many voices as are in the file. And I'm actually going to show you one of those. Uh, here's a little piece by Mendelssohn, which is an eight part piece. And you could... And so it's showing all eight of those files, all eight of those um, parts, and you can use as many as you can. Uh, the, you, um, uh, you might want to keep in mind, I mean, it, it will do as many parts as you put into it. Uh, and I tried it with 
just to see it. <laughs> and it did them all. Um, but keep in mind that phones are limited devices and don't handle extremely complex files very well. That would be a strange thing to put on a phone. But I just wanted to show you that you could do something with eight, 10, 12 parts if you really wanted to. I'm gonna go back to this one for our demonstration. Okay, this is the same one we were working on before, Cantati Domino. Uh, okay, so I think that's pretty cool so far. Um, but wait, there's more. Um, uh, I've always thought it was valuable to mark special spots in the score that I might want my singers to practice. I think sometimes it's tempting for singers to go over uh, and sing the parts that they know and perhaps neglect the parts that they actually need. And in Choral Works, you have the ability to make markers throughout the program to help remind your singers of important spots to work on. So the buttons for this are at the bottom of the screen. And you can set a marker at any point in the program. So here I am at bar five, beat three. Well, you can actually do this while it's playing too. So that's actually a little bit more fun. I stopped right there because we're actually about to start a little section that's kind of polyphonic. I pressed the add marker button and it brings up this little window and you can say, Polyphony, if I can spell, starts here and save that marker. And then you might notice that down here, there's a little bookmark that has that, that spot, bar eight, um, beat one. And uh, you can look at that marker. Look, here's the marker that you just made. Right? And you can play from that marker as well. That's what this button is here. This means play from marker. And you can play from that marker. If I was at the beginning and I press that button, this is the currently selected marker. And I stopped at this part because here's a new part where we go into triple meter. Maybe I want another marker there. And now if I go and look, oh look, here are, uh oh, that's not in the right spot. Here's a, a, tri a triple meter marker that starts right there and you can edit them as well. If you were to go here and say, hey Bobby, work on this spot. That marker would be there. I'm choosing that marker and I can start from I made before is a little funky. I'm not sure why that registered at the beginning of the piece. Maybe I pressed the button at the wrong time. But you could get rid of that marker and now you only have one that's there as well. Okay, so markers are pretty cool. Uh, you can edit them or delete them and like I said when you've chosen a marker it appears in the bottom as the selected marker and you can play it using the play marker button. There are some other things that you can edit as well. Uh, over here, up here in the uh, settings menu, this little cog window up here, there are some things that you can do to uh, change some things about your file if you want to. You can rename the voices, and you'll fi find out why that's important pretty soon. I mean, if you had like a quartet, you could call them whatever you want. You can personalize your CoreWorks files for your own use. And then you see that those names have appeared on those buttons ready for somebody to use. Of course, you're probably not gonna do that you know, if you have a lot of people, but you can call them whatever you want. Or if you have a button that says S1, you know, that doesn't look so good on a button, maybe you'd really wanna call that Soprano. Soprano! Right, and then so you can change the numbers of the buttons. Right now, the, you can see it says cantate.mid up at the top, um, and that's just the file name that I opened, but you might want something that's a little bit more fancy than that. So I'm gonna rename the song. This is what will be appearing up on the top, and I'm gonna call it cantate. Oh, look, I've done that before. And when I was preparing for our presentation, you might have it be something that's a little more descriptive of what you're doing. I'm gonna save that name, and you'll see that that's what appears up here at the top. 
best to uh, keep the file name simple and here you can make the song name a little bit more elegant. So part of the reason I showed you all that is because the next thing you might want to do is to be able to save that file to use with your singers. You've got it looking just the way you want, you know, with Annie and Tommy and Bobby and the generic soprano <laughs> up there and you've got the name the way you want it up there and you've got your markers down here. So you've got all that in your file. Now you want to save it with all of that information. And so you might go here and save the file and you'd give it a name and I'm going to call it cantate. Uh, I guess I'll call it, uh, I've done this a lot. I'll call it concate ACDA and save that file. And what it's, what it did is it downloaded it to my desktop or to my, or wherever your downloads go to it might be your downloads folder, it might be your desktop. It might be, you know, wherever you, you, you have to know where downloads go in your computer. And then if I go back, so now it's on my computer and I'm going to just sort of prove it to you. So here I went back and got rid of that file that we had open and I'm going to go to my file and open contact the one I just made contact cw.midi open and like magic. Oh, I must have opened the wrong one because the voice names didn't come back. I don't know where that is. I think I opened the wrong one, but, uh, but you can see that there's uh, markers there. And yeah, I did open the wrong one because you see the markers are different. Um, but it, it saves the markers, it saves the voice names, it saves the, um, the, the song name too. So um, the, it's a, uh, when you reopen it, all your stuff is still there. And the neat thing about this is it's a standard MIDI file and MIDI files are very, very small. Um, they're, they're even smaller than XML files, which is what Ariane was talking about this afternoon. And that means it will open quickly on the internet and it makes it easy to get the files to your students. And of course, you know they'll practice diligently and come to your rehearsal with all of their notes learned so you can concentrate on making music in your rehearsal. All right. So I think all of that is pretty nifty and I think you can see the power of the tool. I hope you can. Uh, especially in the Corona apocalypse, I think many of us have learned that we need good tools to help our singers at a distance. Of course, we want to sing together, but we also need to give many of our students extra help to be able to make good use of rehearsal time. Um, and incidentally, this can be a very good way for singers to learn their parts for a virtual choir project or for something like a county or district chorus, if anybody gets to do those this year. Um, but seriously, you may not be able to buy Note Flight or My Choral Coach for every singer in a district or a county chorus or maybe note flight is a little too much for your church choir budget or something like this. This can be one of a suite of tools that you can use to help your singers. Okay, now uh, I've kind of finished with the demo part of, uh, of, the, of the presentation. I have a lot more to tell you about, but I thought this might be a good place to pause and to, um, and to uh, ask if anybody has any initial questions. Ask questions about what you've seen so far because I've still got lots to show you. Um, uh, like how to put these things together and all that sort of stuff. But if you have any questions about what you've seen so far, I'm happy to try to answer those. Rob, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna give, I'm gonna feed you questions. First okay. of all, we're about to, in just a moment, we're about, you're about to have us download it and use it, right? The app. Uh, I'm gonna give you, uh, it's actually a web app, which means it's like a glorified web page. And I am going to give you the link in the, in the chat so you can all try it out. Okay. Um, uh, do you, can you use an XML file to load in or does uh, it only just take MIDI? It takes MIDI uh, and not XML. Um, but uh, those of you who are at the, at the um, seminar thing this afternoon, uh, any notation software that can make an XML file can make a MIDI file too, just as easily. Um, in fact, they're, they're actually easier uh, for most programs to make. So any, any, uh, any notation software, MuseScore, Finale, Sibelius, NoteFlight, any of these things will export a MIDI file very easily. And I'm actually gonna show you that here in a, in a few minutes. And then you can make as many markers as you want, right? You can, you can indeed. And then when they, sh but the way you get to them is you click the plus sign next to the markers and then it'll give you the full menu of them. Is that correct? You actually click on this, Thing okay. right here, which shows you the um, shows you the list of all of the markers. 
Looks like there's a little bug going on there right now because it's just saving. Well, actually, that was the right spot. So more markers and more markers. And then if you go look at your list, here's your list. More markers, more markers, more markers. And um, you notice it's always sorted in chronological order. So that it will always appear uh, first measure, ninth measure, 16th. <coughs> they always appear in chronological order. You can um, get them or whatever. So yes. Rob, I'm imagining a scenario where you start with your piece and maybe you put in like the big mile markers, right? Like you put in, you know, section or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then you save that one. And then yep. that's right. Then you put, you, right. You, I think it would be helpful because then you can then re upload it. Yep. Add more markers and save it under a different name. Yes, absolutely. Not, right. only, not only that, but your students or whoever is, is consuming these things can also make their own markers. You know, if they have a spot, if you have a motivated student, they, and, and you can encourage them to do this, they can make markers wherever they want as well. And, um, and, and, and then also save the file for their own use. Although, of course, it won't update the one that you've sent them. So it's really a matter of, you just have to be careful how you're, um, labeling both the markers and then labeling the files you know you I, I might have a file that's like marked for the tenors or marked for the bases or however you know or marked for section leaders or something so that you know what you've got you could or you could just put all of those uh you could just put all of those markers in the same file yeah it's very flexible you can do it any way that makes sense for your program uh, i sort of imagine that you know if you have um, the, the whole idea is that everything is there, so you could make, you know, 20 markers, some for the tenors, some for the altos, some for the bases, and, and just distribute one file. It could, I could imagine it getting a little unwieldy if you're making lots and lots of different files for lots and lots of different sections, but however you want to do it is great, I think. Yeah, somebody asked in the chat, from what type of file do you create a MIDI file? And uh, that's very important. I, I, again, I'm going to show you that in a minute. But you, any no, music notation software, and also you can go out on the internet to uh, any of these choral uh, MIDI uh, MIDI sites and get some things for free as well. And like I said, I'll show you that in a little bit. Any other right, questions? When we, when we saw the CPDL site today, there's some that are XML, and there are some that are MIDI, and there are some that are in various states. Yes. Um, of, of Finale use. and Sibelius and note, uh, note, a Notepad and all kinds of different things. But almost every, either at CPDL or any of these places, they might have a MIDI file, they might have a music notation file, like a Muse score or Finale or Sibelius file. And you can always open those in Finale or Sibelius and then make a MIDI file from there. It's very, very easy. And I'm going to show you how to do that here soon. How are we doing? Should we go on? I think we're good. We're about to download. And um, I just want to make sure this is ready. This program is ready to go now, right, Rob? You've already been using it. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, it's well, good to go. It's good to go. I'm going to get I'm, the reason I'm not giving you a link right now is because I want you to pay attention to me for a while. And then <laughs> as soon as I give you the link, I will have lost all of you because <laughs> you're going to go play with the thing, right? So uh, I, I'll ask your patience just for a few minutes and then, um, and then I'll give you the link and, and, and then you'll always have the link and you'll be able to do it. And you'll know a little bit more about how to use it and all that stuff too. So we'll get there. All right, let's go on, I think. Uh, I'm gonna do this. Um, so all, I think CoreWorks is pretty cool, but none of it matters unless it's easy for you to set up and use. And so we're, that's what we're going to do now. We're going to go through the process of how you set up and use uh, MIDI files for CoralWorks. And so here's what you need. Basically, what you need is a MIDI file and a way to make the MIDI files available on the internet for your singers. And uh, that's actually a little trickier than you might think, but I'm going to show you how. So the first thing you need is a MIDI file. And like I said before, any music notation software will make these. And there are hundreds, thousands of them available on the internet, often for free. Um, cpdl.org, I can write that actually down in the thing, is one of the most, whoops, except I did it wrong, cpdl.org. 
is one of the main sites um, where you, there's literally tens of thousands of, uh, of files on there that you can play around with. And a lot of them, they're not, they're not necessarily all, you know, old, old 15th century, 16th century music. Some of them is, we were talking earlier this afternoon that some of them are just, uh, are brand new things that are out there. So that's pretty cool. Okay, so you start with, uh, you start with a MIDI file. And um, if you do, and I mentioned CPDL, but if you do a quick search on Firefox for free uh, or on any internet for free Coral MIDI files, you'll find a whole rabbit hole. In fact, why don't I show you that? I actually did it a little earlier so I could show it for you. If all this is is a Google search for free Coral MIDI files. And look at all this stuff, MIDI Coral Music. This is actually a great resource right here because it's uh, links, somebody did it for a music education class. It's links to a whole bunch of other ones, right? Some of them are great, some of them are less great. Uh, Coral MIDI sites, Cyberbase, Rehearsal Learning Aids, MIDI Rehearsal Files, MIDI File Archive, look at them all, they're just everywhere. And all that just came from this simple search. And if you start to refine that search, you can find more stuff than you could ever use. So um, I think that's all pretty useful. <clears throat> I'm gonna, uh, actually, I think I'm just gonna, in case I need that browser back, I'm just gonna make it smaller. Okay, uh, also it's easy to make your own with uh, notation software of any music that you've purchased and you can start by editing a MIDI file in your software of choice. Most of you probably know how to use some kind of music notation software. So if you've bought a piece and bought, again, bought all of the copies for your students and you wanna um, sit down at the piano and play that into music notation software, that's not very hard to do. You can get very good at that very quickly. You can begin by editing a MIDI file of your choice and getting it the way you want it. So I'm actually gonna do that right now. I'm going to open a piece in uh, MuseScore. The reason I'm using MuseScore is because MuseScore is free and it's very good. Um, many of you may have used it already. Uh, just about anything you want to do for a choral piece, you can do in MuseScore. And uh, I think everyone is, was likely to recognize this piece. I hope so. Um, and this is a uh, this is a version of uh, "And the Glory of the Lord" from Messiah that I actually downloaded from the internet from one of those uh, MIDI places that I that I mentioned to you before. And uh, here it is. Uh, so uh, we're going to take a look at this file and evaluate for a second why it's good for choral works. Uh, one of the reasons is because for a piece with accompaniment, and I wanted to use one with accompaniment because I wanted to show you how to deal with that in choral works. So this one has an accompaniment. And uh, as I scroll forward, you can see where the altos enter and the sopranos and everybody else. But notice that the accompaniment drops out at that point. And you may not always want that, but it can be really useful if you want your singers to be able to hear their parts by themselves. And the person who put this one together just used the voice parts and then did all the interludes on the keyboard in between and then went back to the voice parts. So that's pretty handy. Um, uh, and so the accompaniment is only there where it's needed. Uh, if you look at the score and uh, play it and see what you want, and I would recommend doing that even if you get something from the internet. If you get something from CPDL, open it up in music notation software and make sure it's what you want. Um, there are some things here that are actually kind of uh, not so useful, like there are these, these names. Somebody uh, included a bunch of other names with it, and you might want to change some of those names. You can change them in CoralWorks, but yeah, you might want to do it here as well. You can go to the staff properties. Oh, you can't see that. I have to put it up here for you to see that. But you can change that name to Prano. And you might want to go to the, oops, that isn't what I want to do. Go to the other ones, change them to. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Let's assume that we've done that all the way along. We might want to make this one into, let's see if it was. Might want to make this one into accompaniment or keyboard probably is better. 
uh, didn't change it because it's, it's connected to the other one. You'll be able to change that in CoralWorks. The point is that you want to get everything here the way you want it to be in CoreWorks. If you don't like the tempo, you can change the tempo. Uh, if you have any note mistakes, you can change any of those. And you might notice this score is pretty ugly. Uh, it has no text or anything like that. And CoreWorks is all about sound. It's not about uh, showing you an image. Um, uh, and uh, so the idea is that the students have their music in their hands. Uh, but one thing that you might notice here is if you were to make this into a CoreWorks file, you'd probably get a button for soprano, alto, eventually tenor, and bass, and you would get a button for the right hand of the piano and the left hand of the piano. And you might not want to do that. You might want to just have one button for the accompaniment because that makes your interface a little simpler. So part of the reason I chose this piece is because I wanted to show you that you can, in most, well, in any music notation software, you can select the everything, and you can then use a tool and implode it. And what that did is it took both of those staves and put them all on this, on the, on this top stave. You can see all those multicolored notes. All those notes are crammed in there. You could never, you'd never want to read that on the piano, but you don't care because all that's going to be um, uh, played in your MIDI file. And then here you actually want to get rid of this one, which is now superfluous. I'm going to go up here to the instruments and I'm going to get rid of that staff. And so now what I have is just five staves, all the voice parts and all of the accompaniment together. And now I might've gone through that kind of fast for you, but you'll have the video and then, you know, you'll have the PowerPoint and all that stuff to help you out a little bit. And then, you know, there's lots of YouTube videos about how to, about how to do anything in MuseScore. Um, you, if you were to look for um, uh, implode staves for MuseScore, you'd find all kinds of things to help you out with that. So now you have all that stuff. Okay, so now we've combined all that sort of stuff and I've got it, uh, let's assume that I now have it the way I want it. I'm going to export it as a MIDI file. You can do this from Finale or Sibelius or anything you want to. Let's go up here to the file menu. You're going to export. I should have done that more slowly. Sorry, I'm used to moving quickly. So if I'm up here in MuseScore, if you want to save as a, MIDI, as a MIDI file, go to File and Export. Not Save As, but Export. And, oops, the window moved to a different spot. Here's where you can, you can choose lots of different ways to export. You can export it as a PDF if you're printing it. Uh, as graphics files, et cetera, et cetera, uh, as audio files. Here's the XML files that Ariane was talking about earlier, right? They normally used uncompressed ones, they're small. Um, so you can use an XML file, but you can also do a standard MIDI file, which is what we want here. I'm gonna put it on my desktop. Uh, I'm gonna say Glory ACDA, let's call it that. And I'm gonna save it as a CDA, okay? That's all you need to do to make a MIDI file that would work in CoreWorks, all right? It's good to give it a simple name because it's eventually gonna become a link. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later on, okay? Um, the, now the next thing that you're gonna wanna do is you are gonna want to open this file that you just made in CoreWorks to refine it a little bit. Remember we have some some things we might want to clean up here a little bit. And so I'm going to make that a little smaller. And I'm going to go back over here to my, um, to my CoralWorks app. And I'm going to choose the MIDI file that I just made. So I got a lot of them on my desktop. Here's Glory ACDA. I just made that. I'm going to open it. And look, here's all my parts, right? But it isn't really how you want it to, to be, right? You don't have a good name at the top and you have all those, it actually didn't save those names since it depends on which notation software you're using, whether those things actually make it into the MIDI file. And oh, it did save the keyboard, that's kind of interesting. Uh, but here's a place where you can go and now make it, like I showed you before, the way you want it to be. So I'm gonna call it soprano, alto, tenor, bass, keyboard, and I'm gonna save it. And now look, 
I have my buttons the way I want them to be. And now that's, a, that's not a very useful name for the top of your file. So I'm going to rename the song and I'm going to call it and the glory Saya. I'll save that name and that's what will be what appears up at the top. Okay. Now I could make a bunch of markers in it if I wanted to and I can go and save this file. And I'm going to save this as glory CW for coralworks.mid because now I think this is what I'm actually going to use. I save that as a file. Actually, it looks like I already did one of those. And down there on the internet, down there on my desktop, I have this file. <laughs> it's the one I made before. And there's all my stuff. Actually, I'm using the one that I made before. <laughs> I should have opened the one that I should have opened the one I just made to prove it, to prove that I did it right. There's the one that I just made. Okay, now I think this is ready to go on the on the internet, um, and I can uh, and I can do some things for getting my files ready for my singers. So now we've gone through a number of these steps. We got a MIDI file, and we used it in notation software for the big picture. And then I opened it in CorelWorks to refine it a little bit, and I saved it. Okay, so now I have a CorelWorks file that's ready to go. Now the question is, how do you get these files to your singers? And uh, that can be a little bit tricky. You could email them, uh, but uh, that's, that actually is not really a great way to do it um, because if you're, it works great if you're on a computer uh, because it's easy to download things on your, uh, from your email to your desktop or whatever and use on a computer. So if your students are using computers, that's great. Uh, but it's a little hard for phones. It's hard to open a file from an email app on a phone. You have to save it to the device and open it from there. It's not a very elegant workflow and people will get hung up by that a little bit. It's much better to put them out onto the web and email the links so that the students can open them up directly in the app, either on the computer or on their phone. So this can be a little bit tricky. The goal is to put them out on the web, best to put them out on the web, but it's a little bit tricky because um, it would be great to put them on, say, Dropbox or Google or Box or OneDrive or any one of their ilk, um, but Dropbox and Friends just isn't set up that way. They don't want you to be able to access links directly from Dropbox for uh, web apps. They can make public links so you can download them, but uh, they don't want you to actually uh, access those files directly from, a, from an app. So it's important to know that you can't use a download link from Dropbox or Google to as direct links for CoralWorks. But don't worry, I'm gonna show you a good way to do this. Um, there are several ways to do it and I've looked for the easiest and the freest and the most private way to do it. And so I'm gonna show you a free service that will let you do this quickly and easily. And it's a place called GitLab, which uh, will let you host files for anyone to access on the internet without restrictions. All right, so I'm gonna show you how to do this. Uh, I don't actually remember what was in my next slide. Oh yes, here's what to do. Remember, you're gonna get this, um, you're gonna get this uh, PowerPoint in your, uh, in your email here before too long or in the chat before too long, but I'm actually gonna go through this process with you. Uh, see, now this is why I wanted to save this app or this browser. So the uh, gitlab.com, there's the whole address, but if you just type in gitlab.com, that will take you there. And then you see this screen and you see a thing for register <clears throat> for a free account. And it says great free trial, but uh, you're registering for a free account and it's gonna be more than enough space to do what you wanna do. And if you register, it does this little thing where it checks before accessing GitLab, blah, 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 blah. And then it will show you a screen that looks like this. And this is very similar to every other kind of screen you've seen like this when you sign up for an account. Uh, you put in your name and your, the username that you want. I, of course, have an account already, so I can't really go through the process of showing that to you. And you put in your email. Oh, actually, you want to put your full name in there. And then you want to choose a username. And uh, uh, the reason I stopped here is I want you to use something that's um, uh, that is all lowercase and simple 
because this is going to become part of the link that goes with coral rock. So I'm going to use J. Barry. Oh, apparently J. Barry. There's already a J. Barry out there. Is there a Jared Barry out there? Username is available, right? So if Jared Barry was to make an account, oops, sorry, et cetera, et cetera, he could go through this whole process, accept the terms of service, prove you're not a robot. Uh, I would not receive updates via email about GitLab if you didn't want to, and then you'd go ahead and register, and it would take you through that process. Okay. That's very easy. I'm not going to do that right now because, of course, I've just put in dummy information right now. But it's just like signing up for an account for anything. Um, it's free and it's uh, quite private. Their privacy, um, their privacy uh, um, protocol is uh, is very good. So uh, this is a, a thing for coders, and so it's not uh, their folks who are interested in privacy. So I'm actually going to shift to a different window now where I'm already logged into my account. I don't think I need that anymore, so I'm gonna close that. Or I'm already logged into my account. And if I were to go to my account, I would see something like this. Now, when you first log in, you'll see a bunch of buttons. And the first button is, uh, one of the big buttons is to make a new project. And we're actually gonna do that here in a minute. And I'll show you what to do to, to go ahead and do that. Um, it will look a little bit different for you when you first go in um, and I will show you I have a, I've made a whole tutorial about how to go through this process of getting into GitLab and uploading files to GitLab and I will show you how to access that before too long so if I make a new project here it says this this actually I think is what you would uh, what you would see when you first logged in create a new project and you might be tempted to create a blank project don't do that create from template Create from template. Get that in your brain. Create from template. That's what you want to do. I'm going to click on that. And you have a lot of options, a lot of options. Like I said, there's a whole tutorial available that will take you through all this with lots of pretty pictures and stuff. This is probably the hardest part. Um, and so the template that you want is this one. It says pages plain HTML. Pages plain HTML. You'll see that on the video later on. That's the template I want to use. I'm gonna use that template. All right, that's the template I'm using, and I wanna give it a project name. Um, and you might, use, uh, you might use something like MIDI's. I've already used that in my thing, so I'm not gonna do that. So I'm gonna call it ACDA, but you might call it MIDI, or something like that. Um, and what the, the URL is gonna be eventually is going to be this, uh, URL HTTPS gitlab.com your username and then the project name after it right so again the tutorial will tell you how, how to do that this is very easy the first time you do it you'll be like am I doing it right am I doing it right am I doing it right yes you are if you're following things things carefully you will be doing it right and you'll be able to do it uh, one more important thing that you want to do is you want to say may, set the visibility level to public so that the project can be accessed without any authentication. And you can understand why that's important because uh, you want your singers to be able to access your files without having to log in or anything like that. So this just makes them available widely, okay? So that's how you make that look. Again, you will get a tutorial and I'm gonna create that project, that new project. It thinks for a few moments. And this is my project right here. And the thing, this all looks a little bit scary. Most of this you don't even need to deal with at all right now, but mostly what you wanna do is down here, there's a folder called public. And anything you put in that folder is going to be available to the public with a, um, with a, a link that I'm gonna show you how to make later on. So you wanna get in that public folder. And they put some stuff in there so that you could actually uh, you could actually go there right now and there would actually be a page there. But this is where you're going to put your files. And I'm gonna show you how to do that right now. I'm in my public folder. You can see this up here. Don't worry about that. This is my project. This is my folder. And this is the button that you use to upload a file. And I'm gonna do that right now. You can drag and drop it onto this thing or you can click to upload like you've been seeing me do all along. 
I'm going to go gloryacda.mid and open it. And it's, uh, it's there. And I need to say, OK, I have that file there, and I want to upload it. You might notice it's very, very small. 7.4 kilobytes is a very, very small file, not like an audio file, a uh, WAV file, or an MP3 file, which would be several hundred kilobytes, probably. So I'm going to upload that file. I have uploaded that file. It's already, it's there. And then you can see that it's there. And if I go back to this public folder, you can see that now my file is right there, gloryacda.mid. And if somebody were to make a link to that file, they would be able to access it through ForWorks. OK, that's pretty cool. Um, now, I know I went, uh, went through that pretty quickly, and I promise you that this, this technological stuff is not beyond anybody, uh, anybody, who's at this, um, anybody who's at this webinar. Uh, the first time you do it, you might feel pretty like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? I've never done this before. But uh, once, once you do it once successfully, then everything will get a lot easier, and it's easier um, to do after that. Okay, now, once you've got the link, you can share that. I'm going to get back to here for a second. Once you've got that, oops, I got to move ahead on my uh, thing here. Uh, oh, I've gotten ahead of myself a little bit. Uh, I've uploaded the files, and then those files will have URLs in this form. HTTPS username, gitlob.io, I showed you this before, whatever your project name is, and then the file name. So it might be something like this. HTTPS, rnatter, that's my account name, gitlab.io, that's where they put their stuff. Midis, that's the project name. And bonjour.mid is an, another piece that I could show you. It's a, a piece by Orlando Lassus. Right. The, the links end up being in those files. OK? So what you give your, uh, you could end up, whoops. So you could, I'm going to go back for a second. You could give your students this link. And in fact, I hope it's still there. So if I go, I'm going to go back to my CoralWorks here. I go back home, and I'm going to put that link in here. You'll see that that's the link I just made. I hope that file is still there. And look, there's my bonjour.mid. I didn't do the whole thing where I changed the voices and the, and the file name for this one, because it's from a while ago but you see that it's actually a pretty simple process once you actually get there. And I didn't make any markers in this one either. Okay, so you could give your students, your singers, a link like that, and they could put it into here and go get their file. Easy enough, right? Um, but uh, that actually, there's actually a better way to do it where you can give them, where you can give them a link that both opens CoralWorks and opens the file at the same time, and you can use URLs that combine a CoralWorks link with a GitLab link. So right here, I'm going to lose some of you because this is actually where you would go to uh, go to the app. If somebody really, really wants to go to the app right now, they can. Uh, HTTPS CoralWorks.sites.gettysburg.edu is the base for CoralWorks. And then there's this little extra thing, a question mark, an ML means MIDI link, and then the actual link to the MIDI file. This is all one big link, and it all goes together, right? So if I were to, I hope I can, I wonder if I can copy it from here and show you that. If I go up here, uh oh, I hope I'm not going to, I'm going to actually open up another window to show you that. I'll make this bigger. Fingers crossed. There's that whole big, long, massive link that I just showed you. I put it into the browser and press play. And then I get my ooh. And it opens up. Oh, it's a different link. It's a different piece. But uh, it opens up the, the program itself and the file that you, um, that you gave them. That's kind of nifty. Takes a little while to get there. But once you get there, it can be very convenient. So what that means is that what you want to give your students, you're basically adding two links together. The base link for CoralWorks and the link for your file with this little extra part in the middle. 
What that means is that the best way to give this to your students is to give them something like this. You can give them an email or make a web page that looks something like this. Your, maybe your choir is called choir at superchoir.com. Here are the choral links pieces to uh, the choral links, links, choral works links to our pieces for choir, happy practicing and the glory of the Lord. Uh, I didn't actually make that into a link. Maybe it will do that. No, maybe it is a link. But there's the, th there's the, there's the link right there. If you give them a list, that has links right in it. I should be able to follow that link. Let me see if I can. Hyperlink, open hyperlink. You're ready to go. Okay. So I think this is the most convenient way to give files to your students. You send them an email or make a web page that has these links on it they go click on the link and they are right where they need to be to practice things that they want to do you can put these links anywhere you can put them on a web page or a google classroom or wherever you wish whoo that's amazing okay so i'm going to do something really dangerous right now um, i'm going to put one or more of these links up for you here i'm going to do this one i'm going to put it into the chat and I'm going to invite you, if you want, to go click on that link and see what you can do. Now, the thing is, is that you should make sure your, your sound is off. Uh, let me make sure. And I'm probably gonna lose a bunch of you right away because you're gonna wanna go play with the toy. But if you click on that link, it should open. Yes, David, that is exactly right. You just add coralworksites.getypr.edu question mark ML equals to before the, the piece link that you create. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And I bet a bunch of you are doing that right now. So and Rob, I'm just gonna interrupt you for just a second. Yeah, sure, of course, no worries. Um, so I just want us to make sure that everybody heard, right? Like these are links. Once you've created this whole thing, you have this link and you can disseminate these links any way that you disseminate any other link you've ever sent out. So email, remind, texting, you know, have at it. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's just like any other link you've ever, you've ever sent to a student yeah. or, a, or a singer or whatever. Yeah. However they access, however they get links from you and however you give them links, you can do that with these that you create. And they'll open on a computer, and they'll open on a, and they'll open on any smartphone that's reasonably, um, that's you know, uh, not not more than a few years old. Anyway, um, it needs a fairly modern browser. Usually, Chrome works very well, um, but uh, it should open in any reasonably um, reasonably good smartphone as well. Hopefully, some of you are trying it right now. If you're having trouble with it right now, I, I will be happy to help you. I hope I hope everything works great. But if something doesn't work, then um, uh, we'll try not to derail the, the presentation right now. I'll try to help you a little bit later on. If we were all together in a conference room or something, and we were doing this at a conference, I'd have you all take out your phones right now and do it at once, and we'd have a glorious cacophony. But we don't want to do that on Zoom. So um, uh, I'll let you have the glorious cacophony in your own, in the privacy of your own home if you want to. Uh, we're going to have, uh, we're almost to the point where we can ask, um, where we can do questions of any kind that you have, but I do want to talk a little bit about copyright before we do that. And I'm going to go ahead and go back to my PowerPoint here and uh, talk a little bit about CoralWorks and copyright. Uh, I think just about anyone who's on this thing, well, first, first thing is I am not a lawyer and this is not legal advice. Everyone is, uses Coral Works at your own risk, and uh, what you do with, uh, with copyright is your responsibility. Um, I think just about anybody who's on this Zoom call would, uh, would agree that copyright is very important. Uh, it's not just the law. Uh, it is the law, of course, but it's not just the law. It's a good idea, too. We have a responsibility to our students to teach them about copyright and about intellectual property and composers need to feed their families just like we do. Many of you are composers yourselves. And um, you know, um, stealing, uh, uh, stealing copyrighted material is just that, is stealing. Um, so I'm not a lawyer and this is not legal advice, but I have asked a lawyer about this and, and, uh, and done a good bit of research about it. 
of course, public domain. Uh, oh, well, before we get into that, copyright is important. You should always buy music for every singer. I was uh, glad to hear Ariane say that earlier today. And of course, everyone knows that you should buy music for every singer, whether that's a digital copy or a paper copy. You, every, you should have bought a, a, phys, a copy of the music for every one of your singers. And the idea is that you don't want to cheat somebody out of their money. Um, people make a living off of this. Um, and uh, that's what, you know, it's, it's like, you know, stealing an Amazon package off your porch, something like that. Um, the, uh, the status with regard to copyright for MIDI files is a little, can be a little bit murky. Um, and MIDI files, you can make a case to say that uh, MIDI files might be fair use. In some cases, um, MIDI files are fair use, but there are some ways in which they're definitely not. Uh, you can certainly use any public domain music that you want, of course, um, but for music that is not in the public domain, MIDI files don't really constitute a performable unit of the piece. That's part of why CoralWorks doesn't include images of the score. An earlier version of it did uh, when, I, when I made it a, a decade or so ago, um, but uh, images of the score would definitely be a copyright violation. Um, and so CoralWorks doesn't do that right now. And of course, it's illegal to use this Coral Works or MIDI files or any of the things that Ariana was talking about today as a replacement for buying music for your singers, right? You can't just give them Coral Works files and send them on their way or make a PDF and, and there you go. The rule I always use is that I've always purchased a legal copy of, of the music for each of my singers and that way I feel confident that I'm not cheating anyone out of their money. And that's the, that's the big thing. And a lawyer told me that a publisher is unlikely to complain about such a use of MIDI files and um, and you're probably going to be okay, especially if you're using it in an in a um, in an educational context. That uh, that's not that doesn't give you carte blanche to use MIDI files or uh, or copyrighted material, but it certainly is a factor in uh, whether something is fair use or not. Uh, so you might ask yourself if you use rehearsal tracks in other contexts and feel justified that you're doing it right there, then certainly choral works would probably be. Um, would probably be okay. Uh, there is an excellent article on fair use and on Wikipedia. The link is right there. Uh, you'll all get it in the PDF here at the end of the the end of the uh, uh, presentation. And I really recommend you read it. I think it will make you feel good about uh, using MIDI files or uh, XML files, like Ariane was talking about, using those things to help your uh, singers learn stuff. Um, it gives a lot of weight to the idea that. Using MIDI files as long as you've um, as long as you've bought the per the uh, um, the music that um, that's a pretty good idea that you can do that. Okay, uh, so a little bit of a we're we're getting to next steps. Uh, CoralWorks is developing. Uh, I made CoralWorks. Uh, the short uh, the uh, maybe it isn't a very short story. Uh, I've been working on CoralWorks in some version or another since the early 2000s. I used to make them out of individual web pages. And then uh, sometime around 2010 or so, I made one, uh, a desktop version of it using a different program. And then uh, Max went to OS 10 and computer or uh, PCs went to Windows 7. And the, the plugin that I was using to do that just evaporated overnight. And all this work was just gone. And at that point, I made, uh, made the decision that if I was going to continue to do choral works, I needed to program it all. I needed to be able to understand it all. And so I've been working off and on. It's been a bit of a passion project for me. And I've been working on choral works off and on for years. And uh, now, of course, the, um, the internet has kind of caught up. And so you can make a web app that has all of this stuff in it. And it'll work on phones for your, uh, for your, uh, for your singers. The good news about that for you is that choral works is developing. And I am tinkering with it all the time to make it better. Uh, to find any, if there are any bugs in there, um, to find them and squash them. And, um, and I can offer support to people who are, uh, uh, who are wanting to use CoralWorks. And the other thing is that CoralWorks is free and always will be free. Um, I uh, have been uh, very impressed with the generosity of the open source community and all the help that I've gotten to make CoralWorks and the um, software that I've, that I've found, the open source software on the internet that I found to help me. And it's part of my academic research agenda to make this. And uh, so I feel like it's the thing that I can do for the academic community 
to um, to support what we all need to do to help our singers learn uh, learn their choral music. There are a couple of things that you can do if you want to uh, to sign up for email updates. Now, this is just a Google form. The link is there, and again, it'll be on the PDF. I can put that in the chat for you. And basically, what that is, I would never share your I would never share your uh, email address. Basically, just ask for your name and email address. And I would never share your email address with anybody. I'm not interested in selling anything to anybody. And um, so uh, you can feel pretty confident about giving that to me if you want to, because you're just giving it to me, the guy you see on your screen right now and whose email you have. So if I were ever to abuse it, which I never would, you could complain directly to me if you wanted to. Um, and I, I don't do that very often. Um, uh, basically, if there's some big new feature that comes out or something like that, or there's a bug that I've squashed that's a big bug that makes it not work very well, then I might send out an email update to let people know. There's also a support form at this other link, which I'll put in the chat right now. This is also a Google form. Basically, it gives you, I guess I should have said what it was. First link is email updates. Second link is support form. And that would give you a chance to, if you're having a problem with something, you could write me a little note that says, hey, I, uh, there's something that's confusing or something that isn't working. And uh, you can uh, you know, fill out that form there. And uh, I, I look at those a lot on the weekends and, uh, and try to answer those as they come in there too. Okay, all that stuff is totally optional. You don't have to do any of that to use CoralWorks. And I, um, I am happy to have you either um, engage me about help or not, uh, or just use it and enjoy it and get something for your students out of it. Okay, my mouth is very dry because I've been talking a lot, uh, but I am very interested to hear any questions that you might have. And I'm just grateful for anyone's, anyone who's interest, interested in using this. If you get some use out of it, if uh, it helps your program, then I've done my job. And uh, I, if, if you have trouble getting it, if you want to get it going in your program, if you're really excited about getting it going in your program, email me and I will help you. Um, and, uh, and that's kind of my story. I'm going to go try to find my window that has all these videos on it of you. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Maybe, oh, there you all are. Now I can see you again. Okay, Rob, a couple of things. Let's go, let's go, bring it on. Let's go. So just to, um, so one of the questions was, can you take MIDI straight from CPDL or one of those things and just go? You How could, you, you could, but you don't want to. You could, but you don't want to. And I'm gonna tell you why. The, the files that you get off, the, the, MIDI, the MIDI specification, the, the thing that describes how you build a MIDI file, it's very fascinating reading if you ever want to go there, but I don't recommend it. Um, the MIDI file specification is very, very flexible. And what that means is that different programs make MIDI files in different ways. So you might have, there might be a lot of extra stuff in there, or there might be a MIDI file that has all of the parts on one line, kind of like the one I showed you. That's a type, type O MIDI file. It's not very often used, but some of but some of the stuff on CPDL works that way, where they cram all the parts on one on one uh, one staff. And if you were to just take that file and say okay and send it out, then um, it, it doesn't get all these features that you want. You're not sure that every voice is on is on its own staff. Uh, you don't have a chance to make markers. Well, you could make markers in your CoreWorks file. Maybe it works great, but I think most of the time you'll probably want to open it in Notation software first then get it the way you want it, looking in notation software, save it as a MIDI file, then open it in CoralWorks and give it a song name, change the names of the voices if you want, put in some markers, then save that file from CoralWorks and that's the file you give your students. That's the file you put up on GitLab and then send a link to your students. Does that answer the question? Maybe, hope so. Somebody that David, that was David's question. So I just want to, David, thumbs up, we're good. I have a thought and a question. Um, what you were just talking about, Rob, if you took that file 
You know, we were talking about on XML earlier in the Arian session about just adding a wood block as a metronome, kind of, you know, as a tick, right? Yes. You could, if you take your MIDI file and put it in notation software and add a trap, you know, and add a voice part, that's just the metronome, right? That's a wood block. Could you do that? Right. Absolutely. And then, and then you've got your click, you've got a click track that actually clicks if you need that extra bonus um, you could, to help your students. Now that, that won't work exactly in the way that you describe because uh, you remember that the, um, that the sounds are all piano sounds right now. Right. So if you were to put in a part that was a was a that was a uh, a wood block, it wouldn't sound like a wood block in Coral Works. It would sound like a piano. So what you might do about that is make a note that's really high. Right. So it just goes ding, 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 and then stay tuned because eventually I'm going to put one in a metronome, so that Coral Works has one already in it that you can just turn on. But you know I've already spent a thousand hours or so. <laughs> so <laughs> more features are coming there's another feature coming where uh, there'll be little stars next to the buttons so that all you have to do to highlight one part is to click the little star and it'll lower all the other parts and highlight just that one voice but so it's a little teaser to let you look at what coral works 1.8 will be there a little later on so I think for right now, if you wanted to do that to make a to make a metronome, ting, 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 make it very high in your piano, and you'll get a sound that's very much like that. That's a great question. Uh, David says, so it's maybe better to start with a notation file rather than a MIDI file and export it as a MIDI file. Yes, absolutely. If you you can skip the whole CPDL thing, if you take a, a an octavo and you open it up in your music notation software or scan it so you know there are some things that will do the notation for you and then get it in your notation start with the notation yes absolutely skip that step if you want to one of the reason i like musescore uh, by the way is that uh, sibelius does this too is that musescore makes very clean midi files um, and uh, there's not a bunch of extra junk in there sibelius does that too Finale is kind of old school. It, it, there's some, I've done stuff to get the junk out of there, but um, every once in a while there's a little junk in there that makes it a little harder, but it shouldn't be anything that slows you down. More questions, bring them on. Ooh, I'm doing well on time. Excellent. Go for it folks. I've definitely, I think I've gotten everything in the chat, but feel free to you know, yourself. roll and go. Yeah. And also, if you just want to comment on anything you see, um, like, uh, or there's something you, you look at it and you go, I wish it could do this, and maybe that's in the plan. Or maybe you've all been on Zoom too long. <laughs> that's very possible. Zoom makes me very tired when I'm in Zoom meetings all day, so. I imagine a lot of you are feel the same way. All righty then. So, uh, like I said, you have, you, I, uh, I put the the PDF of the CoralWorks presentation up in the chat, and it'll end up on the website too, uh, along with the video of this presentation. I think the best way to use those things is in tandem. So the uh, the PDF will sort of give you the structure of the presentation. And then you can skip around in the Zoom video to find the spot that, that where I explained or showed how to do a particular thing. And also, I really am serious about, um, really am serious about use the support link, use the email link, use my email, and let me know. Uh, somebody asked, uh, uh, where do you go to find CoralWorks? The links were up in there, but here's, I'll give you the link one more time. That's the link to the main part of the program. And oops, I sent that privately. I should have done that to everybody. And I'll just copy and paste that good that bad boy right there. I'm just gonna say you really 
you all really need to make sure that you um, enable Rob to use his bet to kind of uh, get into his best nerd tendencies. <laughs> continue to work on all of this. Um, it's really exciting and he really is excited for it. And, um, and really it don't feel like you're not going to be able to get feedback from him or work with him on it or anything, because I, I've just kind of seen the energy he has to do this. My nerd tendencies are very high indeed. And I'm, I'm really serious. If you want to, if you really want to use this program in your, uh, uh, Coral works in your program. I will help you get started if you want that. Yeah. Awesome. Once again, thank you, Rob, for this fantastic presentation. Um, as a reminder to everyone, we have one more uh, tech session tomorrow afternoon at 1 p.m. Eastern time, and that is on My Coral Coach. So if you're interested, it's the same link that you got in tonight, and we will see you all tomorrow. Can I add one thing really quick? If you have needs if you have um areas that you would like us to address or talk about um we're you know always looking to make content for you that you can use right so um you can contact us through the website or on facebook or however and we'd love to hear from you and um and see what we can do to kind of make sure our community is as strong as ever sorry jared go ahead no that's all so have a great night, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night.